Okay. So, so far we discussed about the various aspects of the DNA structures. Now we are going to talk how NMR uh, can be used in this. So, what is our first observation in NMR? We have to talk about the chemical shifts. Proton chemical shifts, we talk about the proton chemical shifts and what are the protons which are possible. We already mentioned about the various protons in the, in the DNA and in the RNA in various places and I will show you here, I have just listed them here. And the proton chemical shifts uh, as we have already seen can go from 0 to 15 ppm with respect to uh, particular reference. Typically when we all we record in water, typically we use a TSP as a reference, uh, then you have this ppm 0 to 15 ppm. Which protons appear where? Okay. Now what are the protons which we have? We have the sugar ring protons. Sugar ring protons are here 1 prime, 2 prime, 2 double prime for the DNA, 3 prime, 4 prime, 5 prime, 5 double prime. These are all part of the sugar ring. Okay, 5 prime, 5 double prime lie outside in the backbone. And then these are the bases H2, H8 and H6 which H2 and H8 are present in both G and A and H6 is present only in C. Okay. H2, H8 are present in both G and A and H6 is present in C. And these nomenclatures are important, one has to remember this. Okay. Now with regard to the um, loops and these are the amino protons, NH protons are the amino protons and these all on this in this area we also have the NH2s, G, C, A, we have the NH2s in all these three bases, we have seen that. Okay. In the, when we are talked about the various um, base pairing schemes, we saw that there are, there are NH2s in each of one of these and they also appear in this A region and this is what is this ppm? This is about 7.5. So 5, 7.5, 10, 12.5, 15. So around 7.5 area you have this 7.5 to 8, 8.5, you have these base bases and then you also have the aminos. These are the G, C, A and you come in this area from 10 ppm to 15 ppm you have the aminos, aminos of G, T and U. Okay. G, T and U these aminos appear in this area and these are the ones which are present in the loops, these are not hydrogen bonded, these amino protons are not hydrogen bonded therefore these are mismatches, okay. this called as mismatches that are the loops. These hydrogen bonded one, this is the GC pair and AT pair, GC pair appears earlier. Okay, so this is around 12, 12.5 and the AT pair appears later. Of course, this 15 ppm is a little bit, this is the wider range here. Typically, you will find them around 14, things like that, okay, 14, 14.5, that is where you will find them. And you have this GC pairs appearing in, in this area and the ATs appear uh, in this area. Okay, and these are all at pH 7, around pH 7 because it is important to mention the pH here because the pH plays an important role in determining what sort of a base pairing can occur okay, because there is a protonation which uh, a protons are exchanging and these are exchangeable protons remember these ones are exchangeable protons. So if you want to observe this you will have to record spectra in H2O and not D2O. Okay. These spectra, these amino protons the, whereas these ones here these are the non exchangeable protons. So these are attached to the carbons, these which are attached to the carbons these can be observed in D2O however. D2O solutions as well. Now if you come to the RNA, RNA does not have RNA does not have the H2 prime H2 double prime, it has only one H2 prime, H2 double prime does not exist in RNA. Therefore now you see because of that because there is an OH group at the 2 prime position this H2 prime gets shifted to this area, Okay, it comes to this area H2 prime, H3 prime, H4 prime. So this is quite a crowded area in the case of RNA. The H1 prime is not affected so much, this is also not affected so much and all the other things remain the same. By and large therefore the proton chemical shift ranges differ between DNA and RNA in this area. This becomes quite distinct in the case of DNA whereas RNA there is quite an overlap in, the, in this region. All right. Now here is a typical spectrum of a nucleic acid, the segment which is given here. So you have a deoxy, this is the DNA segment. So it is a 14 more here G A A T T C C C G A A T T C okay. and this is the sugar ring all the nomenclatures are given once more here. So you have the 1 prime 
and in the basis you have this H6, H8, H2 and H5. H6 and H5 are present in the cytosine, H8 and H2 are present in adenines and on the guanine you only have H8, you do not have the H2. At, at the H2 position there is an amino group in the case of guanine. Now where do these ones appear in the spectrum? This is the one dimensional spectrum here and all these H8, H2, H6 they are present in this area and the H1 primes and the H5s they appear here and the H3 primes are here at around 4.5 ppm here and all these H4 prime, H5 prime, H5 double prime they all get crowded in this particular area, the extremely crowded region. You notice for all the 14 nucleotides they are all present in this. Similarly, and all the 14 nucleotides 2 prime, 2 double primes are present in this and the methyls here, where are the methyls? The methyls are coming from the thymines. The thymines have at the H, where in the case of cytosine at 5 position that is the H5, in the case of thymine there is a CH3 group here. So, how many thymines are there here? You have here uh, thymines 1, 2, 3 and 4, there are 4 thymines and these 4 thymines are present in this area. You can actually count because these are quite distinct. You have 2 here and 2 more here. Okay? So all the 4 thymines, uh, methyls group you can identify in this area. Of course, you do not know sequence specifically which one is which, but the thymines are easier to, under, easier to um, uh, identify because they appear at the methyls appear at a very distinct position in the chemical shift range in the proton. So this is the typical one dimensional spectrum. Okay. What about the amino protons? Now the amino protons as I mentioned to you they appear between 12 to 15 ppm. Okay. So you have these amino protons. For these protons these ones have to be observed in water. The experiment will have to be performed in water H2O. Otherwise in D2O these ones exchange out and you will not be able to see those signals. And you see this particular sequence here this is uh, it goes GATC. Okay, T T C C C C C G G A A. This is the sequence. Okay, so this sequence has a kind of a, a, a two molecules form a stem of a duplex, and then it forms a loop here. This C's and these C's will not be observable to you because they exchange out with water. These four C's will not be observable to you because they exchange with water, and this forms a symmetrical duplex here and with the Watson-Crick base pairs. The Watson Crick base pairs are indicated here the thymine adenine and cytosine guanine which are the protons which are observable and those are the amino protons. The amino protons appear in this range okay. as I mentioned the amino protons appear around 10 ppm so 9.5 to 10 ppm if though and those ones exchange more rapidly with water therefore often you do not see these amino protons you will basically see the amino protons and amino protons will produce one amino proton one signal per base pair because there is only one amino protons whether you take this one whether you take this base pair or this base pair there is only one amino proton in this case that is this one here that is at n3 position and in this case there is the guanine which is at the n1 position okay so we that uh, there now we can see here how many signals are there so you can actually count this is at different temperatures Okay, this is at 278 degree Kelvin and you slowly uh, uh, small temperature you can go up in the temperature. Why do we do this temperature dependence? Because you see the duplex here right this is a duplex. The duplex is the stability of the duplex is the highest in the interior and as you go further towards the end it becomes fragile. So it is less stable. So therefore when you in an initial at the lowest temperature you will see all the signals you will see how many C G's you see here? You see 3 G's, these all 3, these belong to the G's. Okay? There is a symmetrical structure here. So you see this G, this G and one of these G's. So you see 3 G's okay? because this become at the base of this loop, this is not so stable. Okay? So you will see that one exchanges out. So you see these 3 G's which are present, these belong to the interior of the duplex. Okay? And these are the T's which are present that is this one you have 1, 2 and 3, okay. 3 T's which are present here you have all of them present at this point, okay. they are pretty well seen. Now as you start increasing the temperature you see that the duplex which is present here starts melting. It starts melting slowly this immunoprotonal is melting meaning what the base pairs start separating out. 
once the base pairs separate out then they become exposed to the solvent to the exposed to the water then they will start disappearing. So, at this temperature this is you see the everything is exposed uh, all of them are exposed they are uh, exchanging with water so the completely the lines are broadened out. If you go still higher there will be nothing seen everything will be the no signal will be present in this. Therefore, to find out whether your structure has the duplex or the base pairing has happened or not you have to do the experiments at low temperature and monitor the amino protons. And here we show the uh, thermal stability how you can measure determine the thermal stability of a DNA hairpin. You have this hairpin here G A A T T C and then you have the X n there are many other um, base, bases here which are in the loop and you will not find signals from there. But the ones which are paired here you will find the signals for this. This is the one particular molecule which is going around and forming a hairpin structure. You will see peaks for these ones. You will see peak for this G and you will see peaks for the T's ok. And those ones are the ones which are present here and you can see as the temperature is increased this is 5 degrees centigrade, 25 degrees centigrade and you have this uh, 35 degrees centigrade ok. And so, this the positions are indicated at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, these are the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, these are the ones which are present here, ok. So, you have uh, the G's which are present here at position, uh, this is at position 1, and so this see the sequence is going like this, this is the single sequence, ok. And this G and this G are not the same, they are different this comes through the loop here and this G and this is the position 6 G that is this one there and then you have the other 2, 3, 4, 5 these are the 80 base pairs A3, these are 2, 3, 4, these are the 80 base pairs. So, therefore, these belong to the thymine, thymine and 3 aminos. So, those ones are distinctly present here and these ones are the um, uh, aminos. So, these are belong to the aminos and various places and, and these ones you do not and they, they, you do not see them very clearly. Even at 5 degrees centigrade you see they are all quite broad. As you increase the temperature these ones will disappear and you have only the aminos which are present in this ATGC pairs and these are possibly the T's X probably is a T here. So, you have this T's which are appearing in this which are not clearly uh, observed. This is the DNA hairpin. And this is for the duplex melting of the duplex DNA I indicated another example of the duplex DNA here you go from this particular sequence you have the CG, CG, AATT, CG, CG ok. This is a self complementary sequence you write the other way around here. So, it forms a symmetrical duplex with the 12 base pairs. So, the 12 base pairs you have so you have how many you can see 6 of the 4 G's ok CG, CG and C G C G there are 4 G's ok and how many T's there are 2 T's A A T T there are 2 T's because we are going to see signals in the amino proton spectral region you will see either from the G or from the T ok. So, therefore, you have 2 T's at 0 degrees you can see both of them and you can see all the 4 G's these are the 4 G's which are present here at 0 degree centigrade. And as you start increasing the temperature, see so they start melting, which goes first. You see, it is this one goes first, right? This one is going first. What does that mean? This will tell you that this is the terminal G, okay? So, this terminal G is actually going first. So, slowly, this is how you identify the as the DNA melts, as the, looking at how the amino protons are disappearing, you will identify them as belonging to which T and which G. So, at 60 degrees almost all of them are uh, vanished and you can see this continues CG1, CG2, CG3, CG4. These are the base pairs, these are the base pairs which are indicated there. There is a symmetry there, there is a symmetry. So, from here to here and from here to here this is a duplex because it repeats itself in this manner, right. So, various base pair what is indicated here is the base pair which base pair is appearing the first base pair will disappear this is the first base pair ok this is the extreme end. So, that is the one which will first disappear then followed by 2 one then followed by 3 followed by 4 ok. So, the 4 is quite in the interior and that will be the last one to go. So, this stays here you see all the way up to 50 degrees centigrade and this is how melting state these were the standard techniques used earlier to find out what is the melting temperature of the DNA. So, here then you plot here 
the melting temperatures of the DNA. So you have various kinds of modulation uh, modifications done if you make a modifications in one in your DNA does it increase the stability of the DNA or decrease the stability of the DNA. This you will figure out by looking at the melting temperature. What is the meaning of melting temperature? If you plot this normalized chemical shifts of the amino protons against the um, uh, temperature here you will get a sigmoidal curve in this manner and the midpoint of this will give you the melting temperature. So at that point of course you will have very poor um, amino proton signals. And by looking at the melting temperature you can decide whether the DNA is stabilized by a particular modification this is unmodified here and this is um, modified here at the particular place these are indicated here at which, which place the modification is done. And, um, and then of course you have another one and the thiot means is actually modified by a sulfur group instead of the oxygen you have a sulfur group here you see this is P2S, 2S. So normally you have an oxygen but these are all modified here. So all the sulfur groups are present here and okay here is a normal one and these are the modify modifications at this point. You have a sulfur group here and then you have two sulfur groups at this point. So both of the oxygens are replaced by the sulfur and how does that change the temperature. So you see when you have uh, uh, oxygen replaced by the uh, sulfur group the temperature has come down quite a lot here. See it is almost 10 degrees so it is very unstable. The normal DNA is of course the most stable one because it has the highest temperature the melting temperature is almost about 65 degrees okay. So as you one sulfur one oxygen you replace by the sulfur you have this um, temperature comes down to 35 degrees to 40 degrees two sulfurs it could even goes even further okay. So this is this was all that could be done earlier with uh, single one dimensional NMR spectra. So melting temperatures see the stabilities of the modifications, stabilities of the DNA and what sort of a structure the particular molecule is having. One also studies the interactions with various other small molecules depending upon the from the one dimensional spectra. But then there is the revolution with this two dimensional spectroscopy which allowed us to identify the individual protons in the uh, DNA segments non exchangeable protons we could modify uh, monitor. Because in the normal case these non exchangeable protons were not very difficult to monitor because of the extensive overlap of the signals okay. But in this two dimensional spectroscopy uh, this came in the 1970s it became possible to study the non exchangeable protons as well okay. So this the theories of these ones we have already discussed we are not going to go into that. So here I am showing you one particular two dimensional spectrum this is a nosy spectrum the so called nosy spectrum which uh, of a particular DNA segment that is indicated here. So a CG, CG, AG, TT, GT, CG, CG. So this is a uh, for tumor. You have this two dimensional nosy spectrum. So you have the diagonal here. See and this area is a, as we discussed here this is the one dimensional spectrum this belongs to the 2 prime, 2 double prime and the CH3 groups. See I also put the primary structure here once more to be able to identify which protons are where and then I have also shown here this H3 prime, H4 prime, H5 prime, H5 double prime those ones appear in this area and next to that is the H1 prime and H5 this belong to the cytosine and here we have H8, H6, H2 this whole area belongs to the H8, H6, H2 these belong to the basis for the various bases okay. Now what does this tell you? Now these peaks here, this peaks here, this tells you about the base-base interactions. So if there is a base stacking, when there is a base stacking, you have two protons on top of each other and you will find adjacent base pairs, you are showing proton-proton interactions through the nosy, short distances. And these ones will show you base to this region and what is this region? This region is the H1 prime and H5 base to H1 prime and this is this goes to this area. So this goes to the H3 prime base proton to the H3 prime correlations, sequential correlations, distances. All of these depend upon which are the short distances here and this ones goes to the base protons to the H4 prime, H5 prime, H5 double prime and this goes from the base protons this area is to the 2 prime, 2 double prime and the methyls. So this is the very well resolved now. Okay, pretty well resolved. Of course, you also have all from the 1 prime to the 3 prime here, 
okay and then 1 prime to the 4 prime 5 double primes 1 prime to the 2 prime 2 double primes you will see here then of course from the 3 prime you will see also the 2 prime 2 double prime and 4 prime 5 prime also to the 2 double prime 2 prime. So the, and then here you have the 2 prime 2 double prime within that within the same base within the same sugar 2 prime 2 double prime these are short distances and therefore you will see NOE cross peaks between these protons. So 2 prime 2 double prime is, is actually geminal so it is about 1.8 angstrom therefore you will always see this this is a very short distance. So therefore you will see all of those ones in this area and you will see from the base protons the methyls are present here from the methyls you will see to the 5 prime, 4 prime, 1 prime and then to the other bases H8, H6, H2. So therefore the amount of information that is present here is quite substantial, quite enormous. Therefore using this you can actually identify the individual proton signals of the individual residues. So this actually made a big change here. Now here I show you the 2D nosy what sort of a things you will get. The NOEs are dependent on the distance between the protons. The distance between the protons and that is in the NOE intensity or NOE means I say the cross peak intensities here the various cross peaks which are present these are proportional to the inverse sixth power of the distance between the protons. Therefore the distances becomes quite important which distance is short which distance is long that becomes important in figuring out which peaks are likely to come. And it turns out here I will show you the distances here this is the nucleotide I this is the sugar ring of the nucleotide I and this is the sugar ring of the nucleotide I plus 1 these two sugar rings are indicated here. This base proton, this is another base proton, these are in the NT conformation. I indicated to you the NT conformation, this base proton comes closer to the oxygen, this comes on the other on the above the sugar ring. In the syn conformation, this goes other way around, this goes on that side. So you will not be able to see that. Okay. So in this conformation, you can see in the NT conformation, you will see peaks from here to its own sugar rings own sugar protons but you will see also from the base proton one base proton to the sugar ring of the next one on the 5 prime end notice this is at the 5 prime end this base proton two short distances are there to the sugar protons of the uh, of the nucleotide which is at the 5 prime end so this one to this you will not see from this proton this to this sugar you will not see that that is a long distance you will not be able to see those ones. So first of all you will see within the nucleotide from the base proton to its own sugar rings okay, and then from the base proton to the sugar ring protons of the residue adjacent to it on the 5 prime side. Therefore that is an important information present here. If you look at this at each base if you look, pick out this area here this is the base proton to the 1 prime protons this is the base to base distance the base to base protons cross peaks okay so this will tell you you can just simply walk from here one residue to another residue one nucleotide to another nucleotide following this base base interactions base base interactions you step wise you go up from one one base to the next to the next to the next and you can go up like that and the same thing you will figure out from this as well or this as well or this as well so you have from the base proton to the 1 prime of the same risk of the same nucleotide and to the 1 prime of the nucleotide at the 5 prime end remember not to the 5 nucleotide at the 3 prime end therefore this provides a directionality while this one does not provide directionality this base to 1 prime and the base to the sugar 1 prime 2 prime or 3 these ones will provide you directionality of to the sequential uh, walk which you may go through in the case of uh, in the DNA. So you will see two peaks from each base proton one to this own one prime and to the one prime on the 5 prime end. Okay, now here is just a listing of uh, the various short distances which are present in the case of RNA and in the DNA and these are important which are the short distances this is about 3.6 angstrom 3.6 and uh, H6 to H2 prime these are the self within the same within the same nucleotide unit. These are the ones which you will actually see. So these distances that you see they are all less than 5 angstroms 3.6, 4, 3.8 and things like that. Therefore you will see all these peaks. In the DNA these distances are roughly similar. Distances which are given as less than 2 angstroms are not valid. This there is a, some 
errors there in those one that is indicated here unrealistically small as a due to the assumption of a rigid uniform geometry and the omission of taking by hydrogen atoms into account from the these are generated from the fiber diffraction models. So therefore the ones which are less than 2 angstroms are not really meaningful. So because there is a when the it is less than the means there is a steric overlap and that is not practical okay. But the other distances are other valid. So you will see these distances they are in the range between 3 to 5 angstroms. You will see all of these distances these are the sequential distances sequential meaning from C to G, G to C, C to G. C to G. See these are all the distances between two nucleotide units, one nucleotide unit to the nucleotide unit at the 5 prime end. So you will see all of those, those distances there. Here is an illustration, here is an illustration of a particular portion of the spectrum. You put take this particular segment here T G G C G G G T. In fact, this actually forms a quadruplex, but so far as the analysis is concerned, one strand analysis remains the same in either case. So, you see here what is present here? These are the H8 or the H6 proton of the base, H8 or H6 proton of the base, okay. And H2 proton does not produce uh, NOEs, H2 proton is far away. When the H8 is close, to the sugar ring, the H2 proton is on the other side of the um, purine ring that will be further away. So you will not see NOE cross free from the H2 protons to the sugar rings, you will always see from the H8 or likewise you will see from the H6, okay. Now you see here the uh, you see cross peaks from but every particular cross peak, every particular base you will have 2 cross peaks, one to its own, one to the sequential. For example, if this is this, the self peaks are indicated by the green and the sequential peaks are indicated by the red. So for example, if I start here, so I get here from C4 self peak its own, then I go to the uh, sequential, I get a sequential peak here. Now from here I move horizontal to find a base which produces the self peak, which produces a green peak. So this is base proton of C4, this is the H6 of C4. From the H6 of C4 I find a H1 prime to its own and then the H1 prime of the residue on the 5 prime end. The 5 prime end means it will be G3, it will be G3. Suppose I took this, this is a 5 prime end. So this is G3, I will see this correlation from C4 to G3. So C4 to G3 I will get here. Now I go horizontal to find the base proton of G3. So I get the green signal here, this is the one which is the base proton of G3 and it turns out that G3 its sequential peak is also close by, it is also on the same one. So there is an overlap here because this portion of the signal is in line with this G2. Where I should go from G3? I should go to G2. So therefore from G3 I go here sequential peak, I go to the G2. So go to the G2, then I have a sequence, this is the self peak, then I get the sequential peak here from G2 this is to the T1. From the T1 though I go horizontal again to find the self peak and then T1. Now how do I know I am correct here? Now you see once you reach the end T1 I do not have any other residue on the other side therefore there will be no signal below this. There will be only one peak there, only the self peak. Therefore this confirms that what we have done here is correct. Therefore this, this is the T1 base and there is nothing below here, there is no sequential peaks. So you can actually continue in this manner, once you have that, so you go from C4, you go horizontal, where do I go? I go to the G5, this is the sequential peak, from G5 to C4, this is the sequential peak. Now I go from here to find the red peak here, I get the G6, so from here to here I go, I go to the G6, then I go to the red one here, I go to the G7, then I go from G7, I go to this red one here and go to the T8. So therefore from the T8 I have T8 to G7, G7 to G6, G6 to G5, G5 to C4, C4 to G3, G3 to G2 and G2 to T1. This completes the cycle. This is a beautiful demonstration of how the nosy spectrum can be used to identify the individual protons in the individual nucleotide units. I think, I think we can stop here.